Check Podcasts. Hi, I'm Bruce Williams. I'm the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to Chamber Chats, happening as always here in the podcasting studio of one of our chamber champions at the Czech Media Group. I would like to begin, as always, by acknowledging that I live and work in the unceded ancestral territory of the Lekwungen speaking nations known to us as the Songhees and the Esquimalt. And Chamber Chats is made possible by the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union. We live in such a great place. People come from all over the world to visit Greater Victoria, to see the things that we have and the hospitality that we offer. That, of course, is all driven through the tourism sector, which when the pandemic began was absolute carnage in the beginning, and the recovery has been slow, but it's been steady. I want to talk about that with my friend and colleague, Paul Nursey, who is the CEO of Destination Greater Victoria. Paul, how are you? I'm doing great, Bruce. Thanks for having me on today. I really appreciate being on the, on the Chamber Chat. Yeah. As we've said before, I'm amazed that through this entire thing, your, your head didn't explode once when you were going through all of the stuff that everybody was <laughs> making. At least publicly. Made. At least publicly. Publicly. Right? Yeah. Good call. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess the baseline, really, the baseline year when you talk about recovery is to base things on what was going on in 2019. Hmm. So how is the sector looking right now in 2023 compared to where we were in 2019? I think we're getting close, Bruce, to be honest. And, um, you know, it, it's different. Of course, but to provide some stats, there was about 2.3 direct and indirect uh, billion dollars of economic activity derived in 2019, and about 4.1 to 4.2 million visitors to Greater Victoria. Um, that's the Statistics Canada number. Um, you know, um, uh, so uh, we won't have a 2022 or 2023 Stats Can number for some months yet because they they take some time and they look backwards. Uh, but in terms of gross revenue. Uh, certainly from our accommodation sector, it looks like we're getting back there. And um, that's driven by a bunch of different things, strong pent up demand in the domestic market, some good international recovery, the meetings and conference center and sports conference center being extremely vibrant. And we're just really grateful. We're grateful for partners like yourself. We're grateful for all our government partners that have helped us through this. We can't do this alone. And um, so now it's about cementing that recovery, uh, making sure it's aligned with the values of our community in terms of sustainability. And making sure it's really broad based. But in terms of top line revenue, you know, I think I think we've had a strong we had a strong 22, um, better than expected, and we're having a really solid 2023 as we kick off here. Yeah, so we're going to unpack a bunch of that stuff as we have this conversation. But yeah, so 2023 you say is looking good. We're going right into the peak season right now, so it's looking strong, right? Looking really good, and I want to knock on wood. And you know, we can't uh, ignore that we have economic head headwinds that we're facing. You know, in the United States. Credit is tightening. Um, they have their banking um, challenges, um, but the the reality is is that consumers are prioritizing travel and experiences over hard goods these days. Generally speaking, of course, every family and household is different, and there really has been a, a strong desire after being locked up for a couple of years to really travel again. So we saw it in twenty twenty two. We saw it in twenty twenty three. We, we are worried that maybe next year and the year after we might lose a little momentum, but for now we'll take it. And it's really a, a solid and broad-based recovery. We do have a lot of challenges in terms of rebuilding our access and capacity and things of that nature. But for now, we'll we'll work with the demand that we have because it's it's ample uh, to keep us keep us thriving here. So let's look ahead now a little more projection into 2024. Um, yeah, this is a very deliberate strategy that you and your colleagues work with to make sure that we are prepared and ready to do whatever it takes to keep the sector strong. So tell me about 2024. Yeah, so 2024 and 2025, kind of the leading thinkers in, you know, forward-looking forecasters and uh, economists are predicting choppy waters ahead. And, um, you know, it's driven by probably tightening household spending and things of that nature. So we are really doubling down on booking conferences and sports events and reasons for people to come. So it's in their calendar. Um, and uh, our team at the Victoria Conference Center, where, where we do operate the sales team, primarily like the international and out of town sales market. The city still does a lot of the good local events. Um, they're really booking business into the future and they're doing a great job. So that's a key foundational piece of business. And then of course, making sure that our um, traditional tour operators, consortia partners, those are groups like Automobile Association or Alberta Motoring Association. Those are what we call travel trade at consortia that we have good strong partnerships there. So that you know the, the 8,500 to 10,000 hotel rooms that we have in the region, are predictably booked, and that provides tremendous stability to everyone else who supplies into the into um, and serves the visitor, whether it be motor coach companies, 
um, you know, attractions, restaurants, sightseeing companies, galleries, if they know, and we can set up confidence as a tourism board, that we're going to be just fine in 2023, 2024, and 2025, because we're going to beat the market, you know, that might give them that confidence to invest in their own business. And that's really what we view as our job as a tourism board, is to provide that, that platform and that foundation of stability. Yeah. I'm a guy who, uh, when I'm walking down the street and I see somebody, you know, on their phone looking yeah. around for something or if they've got a map, I always go up and ask them what they're looking for and can I help them. The reason I do that is, first of all, it's the right thing to do. But secondly, I want to find out where they're from. It's really yeah. curious to me to find that out. So the last time I did that, the people were from Panama. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. was, that was pretty cool. So that international was... international numbers you mentioned before. Um, we were involved in a meeting with WestJet, for example, not long yeah. ago. We were talking about domestic and international markets. Uh, but are the international travelers coming back as you would have hoped? And where are they coming from? Yes, they absolutely are, Bruce. And I think this is what's really been the second step of a two-phase recovery I mean, last year was largely Canadian travelers, um, and this year it's the return of international. And where we are seeing a lot of strength from is Europe, particularly the United Kingdom and then Australia. Um, you know, Pan Panama is a niche market for us, I won't, I won't lie, but I'm glad that they, they came. They probably had to find their way up either through Los Angeles or Houston, and then uh, up through Seattle and on to us, so they really want to come here, which is great. Yeah. But it's also very encouraging to us as we're starting to see leisure travelers come back from Japan a little bit. And um, Japan's one of those important, you know, second tier markets, but very lucrative. We, you know, it's China and others is going to take some time. Um, and the United States is really starting to come back as well, too. That's good. So to these know. are good. These are, and we don't, um, you know, for our organization, we don't go after everywhere in the United States. We only go after, you know, Seattle, uh, California, those really progressive kind of blue states whose values align with ours. Um, and, and I think, you know, those, they fit well here. They fit well in Greater Victoria. They understand our sensibilities, um, and it's it's a good it's a good match all the way around. And Canada is always strong, right? Very, it's very strong. We can never take it for granted, of course, but we invest a lot of time and money in Canada, uh, as do our partners at the at the British Columbia Tourism Board called Destination BC, um, and in the U.S. Mid Hall Market as well, too. So on the leisure side, I think we're feeling like we have our markets covered. Um, and what I really am very pleased with is. Um, the earned media attention that we've been able to generate, which is in 2022 and 2023, has been above and beyond anything we've ever seen before. We'll kind of tweak of our strategy, and that's driven that awareness piece, and we're really happy about that. Yeah, earned media, just for those who aren't familiar with the term, is like something on Czech News or in the Times Column. Yeah, like, yeah, or Connie Nass Travel in our case, or, you know, uh, yeah, earned media would, yeah, great point, Bruce. We're, we're talking inside baseball here, and really <laughs> it's about, in our case, it's travel yeah. and lifestyle media that we get covered, and that's how we generate that awareness and then our marketing campaigns come in and try and convert them into bookings right conversion so yeah. um yeah it's, it's a multi-pronged strategy so needless to say uh air travel pardon the pun air travel has been a little bit of a bumpy ride and i want to talk about that next Our guest today on Chamber Chats is Paul Nursey, the CEO of Destination Greater Victoria. That's our tourism organization for Greater Victoria. So the the whole airline thing has just been it's been amazing to watch about how how confused people are and how difficult it's been to travel. And there's a whole lot of factors in that too. But let's let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, first of all, there's a pilot shortage, right? Yeah, pilot shortage, plane shortage too, right? You know, uh, planes have been retired. A380s for big major planes that <laughs> were parked in the desert were brought back into service. So it's in a, the whole aviation system has gone through a tremendous um, change, a change process. And uh, trying to get air service going in that context has been, you know, as you mentioned off, you know, before the break, a very bumpy ride. To get people here in an airplane uh, from another country means they can't fly directly to Victoria, right? Yeah. So, you know, I think we need to recognize that we are a second tier city mm -hmm. um, and air, airlines, particularly now where their balance sheets are weak, operate a hub and spoke model. So they're going to come into a hub and then they're going to spoke off to us. So um, our direct services will be from short hauls, Seattle, Vancouver, Calgary. We have a lot of good service from Toronto and we hope to establish other medium length routes. Um, and that takes cash. That takes co-marketing investment from us. And our great partners at YYJ doing all sorts of inducement on their sides in terms of uh, landing fees and, you know, those types of things to get them up and going. Uh, fuel costs are a factor, I would think. Yeah, fuel costs are a factor. And the other thing that's been really interesting is the type of plane that comes into our size of airport 
a regional plane, which has traditionally been a Canadian regional jet or a Q400 uh, de Havilland, those are all being phased out and replaced by Embraer. So at the same time, um, you know, pilots need to be trained on new equipment. So we just need a little bit of time to work all that through the system. And it, it is coming back. I have a tremendous amount of confidence uh, at our partners in Victoria International Airport. And we're there uh, loyally uh, with marketing, co-marketing funds to support that process. And it's just a matter of particularly the U.S. airlines and to a certain degree the Canadian uh, airlines getting their core routes up and going again before they can look at the complementary routes, which is where we we fit in. Yeah. We also heard a lot of stories about uh, uh, tie-ups, weights, layovers in airports because airport staff were in a position to do that. I mean, some of that stuff is kind of close to entry level. So a lot of those people, when the air flights weren't happening, just found other jobs and haven't come back yeah. yet. Is that getting any better? It's getting a lot better. Um, and I think uh, it's also getting a lot better in hotels. I don't mean to change the subject, but <laughs> I want to give the federal government a big shout out. They, they made a couple changes that may seem subtle, but uh, international students who are only allowed to work 20 hours a week are now allowed to work 40 hours a week. And right. so for a lot of us in the hospitality business, they already had employees on their payroll. Now they could just increase the amount of uh, uh, shifts that they could do should, should the employee want that. So that helped tremendously. And then, so then what we weren't facing was like systemic labor shortage in all aspects of the, the hospitality value chain. So I took some pressure off our aviation partners, our transportation partners. Once the hotels were able to staff up more effectively and the restaurants, you know, there are people that, you know, many of us have seen the labor market is normalizing a little bit. And so, um, you know, it is getting better. Yeah. Um, I'm not a guy who picks on BC ferries. I happen to be a fan of BC ferries. I've had just about nothing but good experiences with them. And I appreciate their value as a corporate client and a corporate supporter and a community supporter. But there has been a lot of disruption in that service, which is, again, one of those, you know, last mile experiences to get people Absolutely. to Vancouver Island is on the ferries. Yeah. It, it seems to be settling down a little bit, but what are you hearing in the bigger picture? Yeah, a couple things. And I'm just going to sh share an anecdote. I, like you, I'm a huge fan of BC ferries. And, uh, you know, the over the years, their service level has increased. I'd say the care factor of all their staff and associates have increased. Um, we should be very proud of that service. Um, and everyone's had bumps for sure. Um, you know, I recently hosted my counterparts from around the world to hear CEOs from tourism boards around the world. And many of them had never been on a BC ferry or done a float plane experience or, you know, heaven, heaven forbid, a helijet experience in Vancouver, <laughs> Victoria. Yeah. And many of them, or many of them came to, to Seattle and then to Clipper or Kenmore era from Seattle. For those four or five different and highly unique modes, these are very sophisticated travelers who run tourism boards in New York, Nashville, things like that. They were blown away by the experience, the scenery, the views. And BC Ferries was front and center. They loved it. They thought it was incredible. So as residents, we may view these things as a barrier or a hassle. But to a visitor, they are exotic, unique, and getting here truly is part of the experience. And, you know, I'm really just not paying lip service to it. Like it is, if you're on BC Ferries and you're going through, you know, um, Active Pass or through, you know, and, you know, the other ferries going by you and the horn blows and it's a beautiful day and there's different colors of, of, of turquoise in the water and you see the beautiful cabins, like that is a world-class experience. It's just like the Cote d'Azur in many ways. And we just, it's part of our environment, so we take it for granted, right? So I think, you know, yes, there's absolutely been disruption. And where that will affect us is that the weekend get away from Vancouver, Victoria. But as our international travel markets expand and our mix becomes more balanced again, you know, someone who's come a long ways away, if they're delayed an hour to get on a beautiful ferry experience, they'll be okay with that, right? They'll, 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 they'll adjust. I love Active Pass when it's actually active, when those tides are changing and the boats <laughs> rocking side to side. That's just so cool. Amazing. Uh, yeah, there are other ways to get here by boat, if you will, by ship. We're going to talk about that next. Paul Nursey is our guest today on Chamber Chats. Paul is the CEO of Destination Greater Victoria, our local tourism organization that helps support all the great experiences that we have to offer here. So... Uh, you mentioned briefly before about Clipper and Black Ball Ferries or the Coho Ferry coming into the Belleville Terminal. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's remained pretty strong now that they're back, I believe. So, uh, you know, I have had a brief um, from Clipper recently that they're not fully back to 2019 numbers, but they're very happy with their recovery trajectory. And that, uh, you know, I, I don't like to share um, numbers that aren't mine, but they're very happy with their recovery. And, um, you know, I haven't... Um, 
heard from Blackwell in the last month or two, but I would imagine some of the similar trends are holding true for them as well too. And I, I can't underscore enough how valuable and valued those, um, those, uh, those, um, those ferry services are. Yeah. Um, we're going to get a little bit political here. So the day we're recording, this is May the 3rd. So this may have changed by the time this gets to air. Uh, but the Belleville Terminal needs to have an upgrade. And that upgrade has to happen in order for border services to stay here, for preclearance to happen. Because the United States has said, we need to upgrade that facility and make it more secure. So the province has stepped up. They've said, we're in. We've got the dough. We'll, we'll give you that. But the other part of it has to come from the federal government, who, right. who have yet to step in. And you and I have both been pretty adamant about advocating for that. What's going to have to happen to move that along from the feds? Yeah, you know, yes, we do have to get a little political there. And, um, you know, I just want to say, uh, Bruce, you've got, you guys have done a great job. You had Mr. Boissonneau on a chamber uh, function mm -hmm. uh, recently, and we asked him that question uh, to follow along Mr. Mr. LeBlanc's public remarks with Premier Eby. And uh, Mr. Boissonneau's response was, if I if I'm, can interpret it kind of um, through my lens, was that negotiations are underway and discussions are underway and Bruce and Paul be quiet. We're gonna we're yeah. gonna we're gonna get a deal done here. But it's our job um respectively to make sure that we're not quiet and that we're continuing to advance the arguments. Because as you said, not only as has the UF government said that these need to happen, that's not a qualitative discussion. We are in Canada is in violation of our international treaty. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, you know, this has been raised between ambassadors, heads of state. Um, and it's either going to happen or it's not. And our, the risk of losing U.S. customs uh, capacity here has dire consequences on not only Belleville, uh, but also um, uh, other other points of entry. Uh, now, the the other thing I just want to say is that we need a fair deal for our ferry operators as well, too. They, you know, they can they need to make sure that their business model is protected. So these these negotiations are in depth and they're taking place as we speak. And you know, I think. It behooves all parties involved to be mature about it and just come to a fair deal that works for all three parties. You know, there's no, I think the taxpayers and the voters, certainly us as industry leaders and stakeholders, we'd be very disappointed in whatever party of the three parties involved, if they tried to knuckle one of the other parties under or tried to get a small win for the sake of getting a win, you know, there, there has to be a formula here that works. And uh, there is one. So let's just get that done. Uh, and of course, cruise ships are back. This would also impact the cruise ships, but the season's looking strong. Looking great. Yeah. Looking great. And, you know, again, big hats off to the Great Victoria Harbor Authority and their sustainability initiatives and the work that they do shoreside. Um, I, you know, I've worked with lots of terminal operators over my career. I have not come across one that cares as much as the Greater Victoria Harbor Authority does about doing the right things for the community. Um, we spoke about accommodation briefly too. So there was a, there was kind of a hotel room shortage before the pandemic. Yeah. And then some inventory was bought by the province to house those that were not currently housed or at, uh, at risk of being unhoused. What's the story on them being remediated and put back into the market and the creation of new hotel room spaces here? Yeah. So that's a vital question. And it's not just us, it's Vancouver that recently released a report that they're forgoing just a, a huge amount of economic activity, lost economic activity because of their hotel room shortage. So some good news on the gorge, uh, the Vic Hotel, uh, which was previously a Ramada, has been renovated. It was being used for BC for BC housing on a lease. It's been fully remediated and it's back in inventory now. It's been upgraded. It looks beautiful. And, you know, the Robin Hood ho Hotel and the, the Days Inn and the, the Vic, you know, there's now a cluster of high quality hotels back on the gorge, which I think is a great strategic asset because not everyone can afford the, the prices to be right downtown. So to have that next choice right nearby is, is great. Uh, so that's that's good news. You know, there was also four or five hotels in the pipeline. Uh, a couple have been approved. Um, one we're quite confident is going ahead. Um, we don't know the exact date and time yet, but that is the um, UVic chard uh, development in Old Town. On Broad Street. And we are... Yeah, and there are other applications in the pipeline. You know, there's a yeah, application where the old Plaza Hotel was. There's one right behind our offices here uh, at Blanchard and Burdett. Um, you know, there's so, so there's some other applications in. We do know that the cost of borrowing and also the uncertainty around the cost of goods are going to make those developers just take a little bit of extra due diligence to make sure that they, they are still viable projects. Yeah. Um, but there is no lack of interest from the development committee community. 
Um, but we also need to recognize this to wrap up the thoughts. A hotel investment is a longer term return on investment than a, than a strata, than a condo where money's in and the money's out in, in, a, in, in a, a short period of time. Once you build a hotel, you have to operate it. You know, there's a lot more staff involved. Um, no, the upside is also very great, uh, but it is, it is, it's a riskier business for sure. So to wrap this up, you, you talked earlier about a plan. You have to plan. Everybody has to plan yeah. everything ahead. So you have a master plan about your strategy going forward. Can you give me a little snapshot of that? Yeah, so we're doing something called a destination master plan, and that is more about, as opposed to a marketing plan, what does the destination actually need for the next ten years, and what are our priorities? What you know, um, and we're taking input from industry, from government, from the public. In fact, the public engagement piece is going to start in May, and is going to happen in May and June, between some town halls in all parts of Greater Victoria, and some surveys uh, through a, through a professional survey company and through the community associations, Victorian Saanich and elsewhere. We want to get a lot of citizen input. You know, we want to deliberately plan what is the future infrastructure? How many hotel rooms do we need? What type of amenities do we need? What type of attractions do we need? And then we want to then go and not only get input from our municipal governments, then go brief them afterwards and make sure that that's aligning with their official community plan process, right? So that, you know, supply and demand are aligned, policy priorities are aligned. We do a lot of work on sustainability and making sure that we're listening so, yeah, it's called a destination master planning process. It is best practice for tourism boards to do. And we're taking one with a doing creating one right now with a 10 year, 10 year horizon, which I think is a, is a very exciting proposition. Yeah. You know, when you talk about the hotel rooms, too, if you talk to any hotel general manager, they will tell you how many times a day one of their people will be in the lobby with their phone. Go, I can't. I can't get the Uber app in here. I guess yeah. the reception. But what's the deal with that? So ride sharing has to come along with this, too. Right. Ride sharing is critical. And, um, you know, I think, you know, uh, we are looking like a backwater. We're looking like a kind of an out of touch community, like um, by not having it. A lot of us, our staff members, we use Cabu, which is a local ride sharing uh, firm and also a member of DGV. And there's a, a great uh, taxi company that's come back, Current Taxi. They yeah. provide a great service as well, too. Um, but for the American traveler, they expect Uber or Lyft and everywhere that they go, they find it. So it is um, a misaligned expectation and a disappointment to our visitors when they can't find it. Yeah. And there's also a local one called Lucky to Go as well. Lucky to Go, yeah. Lots to talk about, Paul. We'll have to pick up the rest of it another time, but thanks for all you do, and thanks for being with us here today. My absolute pleasure, Bruce, and thanks again for the opportunity. Anytime. Paul Nursey is the CEO of Destination Greater Victoria, and I'm Bruce Williams. I'll see you again for another Chamber Chat.